singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. If you guys enjoy the show, you can help me make it better in one of several ways. Uh, you can simply click on the like button under the YouTube video. You can write a brief review of the show on iTunes, or you can simply leave a comment on the blog or make a donation. As always, I will be the man with the questions, and today the man with the answers will be Ori Inbar. Ori is the founder and CEO of AugmentedReality.org, a global not-for-profit organization dedicated to advancing augmented reality, and the producer of Augmented World Expo, the world's largest event dedicated exclusively to AR, to the AI industry. Uh, in 2009, Ori was also the co-founder and CEO of Augmento, one of the first venture-backed companies conceived to develop and publish augmented reality games, games that are played in the real world. Ori is a recognized speaker in industry events and a sought-after advisor of AR, for AR initiatives, as well as the speakers for the upcoming ISTA's 2013 conference in Toronto, that I plan to attend this June 27th to the 29th. So that was a long introduction, but welcome, Ori. I'm very happy to have you on my show. Hi, Nicola. It's great to be here. Fantastic. So, Ori, uh, what's the best way to introduce yourself and what you do in just a few words? Well, I'm, uh, I've been passionate about augmented reality ever since I discovered that back in 2007. And it was, you know, after many years in startups and large, large corporations, um, I wanted to spend some time with my kids and think about the next big thing. And uh, then I realized they're spending all of their time in front of a computer screen, you know, watching TV, computers, in the Internet, playing games. And on one hand, you know, it's great because that's what kids do in the 21st century. But on the other hand, I felt like we must find a way to bring them some of the experiences that I used to experience as a kid in the real world. So I started thinking about that and then, of course, discovered there's a, a computer science term that has been doing this for many years called augmented reality. And ever since then, it became my passion. So, you know, started a blog about this, uh, started meetups in New York, uh, as well as large organiz- large uh, uh, events uh, all over the world. And, and also started uh, a company uh, to, uh, to start developing augmented reality games. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a fascinating story. So uh, you told us how and why you started getting passionate about augmented reality, but what is the motivation and your future goals uh, being so passionate and working in the field as you are? So the more I got into the space and understood the uh, amazing potential that the idea of, of uh, enabling us to digitally interact with the physical world around us uh, using uh, our visual senses, but also other senses like sound, smell, touch, uh, and, and maybe the sixth and seventh senses that we haven't even discovered yet. So w- once you have that capability, you can truly advance humanity. And, and that's kind of uh, you know, our, our motto for the augmentedreality.org. Uh, it's, we truly believe that driving the adoption of augmented reality in the world will, will really advance humanity uh, towards many of the, the goals that we have as, a, uh, as humankind. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to co- come back a little bit later to augmentedreality.org, but before that, I want to figure out that we're talking in very clear and specific terms. So let's start with the main meaning of augmented reality, the way you perceive it and you understand it to be. What is it? So uh, the definition, at least in my mind, and I think also in the industry, has evolved since the early days uh, where it was really focused on the visual aspect of augmented reality, where you register 3D content with the real world and, uh, and augment it. Uh, but, but I think, you know, the more people have started to use it and the more, you know, other types of technologies have, have evolved around it, I think the definition has, has evolved. And it's including things like wearable technologies, gesture technologies, uh, the Internet of Things, and our ability to interact with, uh, with products, objects, things around us, 
all of these things I think are converging around what we like to call augmented humans in an augmented world. Or in short, you know, we still like to call it augmented reality. <laughs> but but in, in uh, I think in the, the, the core of what defines this new domain, this new ability, is the fact that we're digitizing the interaction between humans and the physical world. And I'm not talking about touch screens, and I'm not talking about, uh, you know, uh, keyboards or mouse or anything like that. It's really about directing physical interaction with the physical world. And, uh, and that is, you know, again, changing probably every, any aspect of life that you can think of. It's going to change how we work. It's going to change how we, uh, have fun, uh, play games and, and, uh, interact with each other. So I think it's, it's one of the most, uh, significant advances that will change the world in, in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. But that's a very interesting definition for me and, and not the, the first one that would come to my mind, personally speaking. Uh, because my perception has been that augmented reality, the way I perceive it, is, has always traditionally been intermediated through vision. Uh, so now when you tell me that it's digitizing our interaction with the real world, you know, I mean, we can do that through all the other senses, for example, touch, uh, smell. Um, so... Help me out here to, to figure out where I'm misperceiving the term. Is it limited specifically to uh, our visual perception of the world? Or are the other senses coming into play in it too? So again, the, I think the original definition was really focused on just the visual sense. Yeah. But since then, I think it, it has evolved. And, and we've seen some great examples of, of how uh, the combination of visual augmentation and smell augmentation Mm -hmm. And touch augmentation uh, can enhance our our experience in in the world, and uh, you know more of these senses are becoming part of of I think the 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 more loose definition of what augmented reality means. So, for example, under this more loose definition, would um, computer to brain interface fall within that augmented reality definition? I think human interaction with the world through the brain is definitely included. And in fact, uh, there's a, a really cool installation called the Ascent, where a person, uh, I don't know if you've seen that, but it, the person has uh, an EEG system connected to their brain. And just by thinking, they can levitate. Uh, because, of course, there's this whole system that uh, holds them and, and kind of hangs them from, from the, the ceiling. But it's done only through brain waves. And for me, it's, you know, it's definitely part of the, uh, you know, augmented human, augmenting humans, uh, because, you know, it's, it's something that you're not doing over, uh, you know, with a mouse or with a controller or anything like that. You're really doing it through your senses mm -hmm. and, and they're just being augmented to, to achieve whole new kind of experiences. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, so for me, that totally expands the very meaning of augmented reality and what it is, uh, which is, which is fantastic. But, there are some critics who would say that augmented reality is fake, that it's not real, that augmented reality is in fact an oxymoron, it's anti-reality. What do you want to say about that? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think the answer is just, you know, let's just look at some of the examples out there, the good examples. Because, you know, yes, like in, with any new technology, there are lots of, of not so amazing examples, but, but the good ones, I think, um, are, are so significant that, that they immediately tell you, you know, how this technology is, is really going to advance humanity. And, and one of my favorite examples is, is called uh, Deep Green or Augmented Reality Pool. And in that example, um, you're playing pool, uh, and there's a, a system that tracks all the balls and, and the cue uh, on the table, and show you a line of flight, which will be the ideal angle to hold the cue in order to get the ball into the hole every single time. Mm -hmm. And the result of that is that any novice player that just you know gets to, to play it for the first time can immediately become a master. And, and now when you apply that idea to practically any aspect of life in terms of tr that requires training or, or you know, maintenance type of things or, or the whole idea of manuals that you read in order to learn how to do things, 
will become obsolete and humans will be able to, uh, to master skills instantly using uh, augmented reality. And it will be initially, you know, with vision, but then also, of course, sound and, and other senses that will augment us and, and help us understand what we're doing and how we're doing it so that we can achieve practically anything. Mm-hmm. Now, that, that your example reminds me very much to an example that I saw about a prototype uh, BMW mechanics uh, uh, augmented reality glasses where uh, you get basically the, the description and the manual and, and how to install and uninstall specific car parts as soon as you put the, the goggles or the glasses on and then you look at the car and you know how to do this and that because it's being literally put in front of your eyes. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I take your point and, that... And, and it, there's, a, there's a whole domain uh, in augmented reality that is focused on training and, and maintenance. And, uh, I, I, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, mm-hmm. but there are certain areas where you already have gear. You know, you have a mask or you have, you know, some gear that you're wearing. And all you need is just to add augmented reality to it. So it's not a big change for the people that are already doing this. Mm-hmm. But the, the the added value is is tremendous, and, and one other example is a, a welding mask, or mm-hmm. a, it's actually a, a, a system to train people how to weld. And because they already have the gear on, uh, you know, it's not it's not something they have to get used to. It's pretty straightforward, and it's training them in a way that was not possible before. I mean, I don't know if you ever tried to weld, but it's unless you know how to weld, it, you don't you can't really learn how to do it. It's really hard. Um, so with the system, you can actually go through the steps, you know, get so, all sorts of lessons. The system can track you, see how you're doing. So in a sense, it, it helps us achieve things again in a, in a much faster and, and easier way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have never welded in my life. So I, I'm ter- <laughs> I, I, I guess I would be a good subject to experiment with this helmet yeah. on. Uh, but uh, so let me ask you this then. Are the major benefits of, of augmented educa- uh, of augmented reality in education and skills upgrading, or is there any other big major benefit that you want to talk about? I think you know when when you think about any aspect of life or work, augmented reality is is going to completely change how we do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know we talked about training, maintenance, games. You know we can think a lot of a lot of uh, entertainment. Uh, aspects that uh, will completely change because now we're not tied to a screen. Uh, even, you know, with mobile devices, you can s- theoretically play, a- play anywhere. You're still looking down and, and kind of have this uh, tunnel view. And when you expand it and we actually interact with the world, with things around you, you become much more aware of what's happening around you. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, that that's kind of going back to uh, my initial uh, instigation for augmented reality is really to get my, my kids, you know, to, to look around and to uh, to understand what's going on, to be more aware of, of their environment, whether they're in the home or outside. Mm-hmm. And with augmented reality, there's a, you know, huge uh, advancement in that respect. Mm-hmm. But again, I mean, I think it, it's, it's uh, if you think about uh, the enterprise, uh, you know, warehousing, uh, you know, safety aspects in, you know, we're seeing this a lot in the process industries, uh, where augmented reality can enhance safety. Uh, if you think about, um, um, you know, again, I, I can, I can probably go through industry yeah. by industry yeah. and show how it has, you know, huge advantages, uh, and, and example, you know, medical medicine, you know, Absolutely. how can I forget that? That, that's, that's a huge area where, um, it will help doctors and and, uh, and other people that are in healthcare to make better decisions, to understand what's going on, to see through walls. You know, you can basically have an X-ray uh, at your fingertip uh, that you can use in order to to treat patients uh, in a, in a much better way. So, uh, again, I think it's uh, this Everywhere. is a massive change in, in practically every aspect of life and work. Mm-hmm. Now, but let me pick up a couple of uh, elements here and, and see. Uh, and that's the the children element and uh, whether it's real or fake, as, as some would claim. Uh, and that reminds me, you know, a couple of cases I want to give you here. There was a case of a couple in South Korea, a uh, young couple with, uh, with a toddler, and their toddler died out of starvation uh, while they were, I'm not sure if it was Second Life or one of the other uh, games online, 
uh, taking perfect care of their digital baby. Their real baby actually did die out of dehydration probably. Uh, and so the question is, do people start to sort of forget the real reality and, and embrace the augmented reality so much that they forget it doesn't exist, that it's not real in some way, in some sense? You know, it's, it's a very sad story. Um, but, if, you know, if you go back to the, the 90s when everybody was in virtual reality, I, I was very excited about this as well. Um, but ever since then, you know, I grew to, to basically have a beef with uh, virtual reality, and that is exactly because of that point. It makes you unaware of what's happening around you. I mean, in this extreme case, it's, it's your own kid, which is crazy. But, but in general, virtual reality and, and the, the key way that we currently interact with computers and digital information is through screens that make us uh, oblivious to what's happening around us. Mm -hmm. And augmented reality comes to do exactly the opposite because it basically requires us to look around, to see what's going on, you know, the people, the places, the things around you, and only augment them with, you know, either visual or other senses. It actually makes us more aware of what's happening around us. Uh, mm -hmm. We're more in tune with, with the now. You know, I like to call it, you know, you play in the now because now you're aware of, of what's happening around you, the people around you. And uh, and uh, the senses are actually much more attuned to to what's happening around you because it's they're augmented through all sorts of digital means. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, um, augmented reality is is gonna fix sad stories like like the one you mentioned, and uh, and again, hopefully, help uh, uh, make a positive impact on humanity. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I absolutely hope that you're right. But let me bring my second point in here. You know, augmented reality has been around for probably 50 years um, in military. You know, I was a five or six years old kid, uh, and my father was working on the Mi-24, the Hind. Uh, I think the NATO designation is the Hind helicopters. And I remember being six or seven years old, being put in the gunner's uh, place, which is the first uh, spot on the chopper, and being put this helmet on, where you basically when you start moving your head and stuff, you can actually see the targeting mechanism, which is precisely augmented reality. It's interposed on the real reality. And then I think it's a 50 caliber uh, cannon or something like that underneath that starts moving, just like the Apache similar system. Uh, and so the, it's been around for a while and it's been very popular in, in everything military. Uh, so let us talk a little bit perhaps about the costs of, of development of augmented reality and the applications or the cost of the applications. What's your take on that? So far, do you think it's been a positive impact on the world or a negative one? So, you know, obviously, um, you know, when, when people started developing and designing these systems uh, in this, probably in the, I guess the first one was even Saturn in 69 and then, uh, in the 70s, you've seen systems like that in, in airplane, in, uh, fire, uh, fire, um, air fighters as, as, yeah. as well as helicopters and so on. Uh, in, in those cases, you know, the, the cost of the, the machine is so huge, it's just adding that thing is, is not significant. And because, you know, you're already sitting in a, in a small chair and you're looking at a certain direction, uh, it was much easier. But, um, it required, you know, the whole system and it was very expensive compared to what you can do today. Um, I think the um, there were two revolutions in, in augmented reality that made it uh, more accessible to the mass market. One was um, when our, our toolkit adapted the, their system to work on in Flash. And then all of a sudden, anybody with a computer and a webcam could create an augmented reality experience and experience it. Mm -hmm. and, and that was kind of a huge uh, boom where, you know, a lot of... Uh, uh, augmented reality applications were, were developed, but it was still tied to the computer. And then a few years later, with, uh, I guess, the first iPhone and then, you know, the Android phones, all of a sudden you had all the ingredients you need for augmented reality in this mobile device, and everyone already has it in their pocket. So uh, it, it was a huge advancement of, of this whole concept. But this is also just a step. I think we all know that we're looking for the eyewear where your hands are free and it's always on, 
uh, and you know covers your entire field of view, uh, that will that will be kind of the next big step that will make basically everybody want to use this every single time of their day. Um, so we're so we're now in the transition to that next stage. Uh, I don't think uh, it's it's happening this year, but it's it's pretty close. Uh, but the fact that we have it on mobile devices is a great step toward a stepping stone towards that evolution. You know, people learn to design for this. People learn how to experience this. So, uh, so I think it's creating the demand. And then, you know, eyewear, which is all, I've also been around for several years, many, many years, actually, uh, will, will get the right investment and the right focus to actually make it uh, mass market ready. Yeah, I think I, I wear, I, I think I've heard about eyewear being used since the 12th century or something crazy like that. <laughs> but speaking of the latest uh, eyewear and about something that you just said that I want to take uh, issue with that everybody would want to jump on that bandwagon. Uh, Google, let's talk a little bit about Google Glass here and take it step by step. So first of all, have you tried Google Glass yet? And what's your take on it? So I actually didn't have a chance to try it myself. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's one of the best things that happened to augmented reality because, you know, if you look at the, uh, the trend line of people learning about augmented reality, it jumped double or triple when Google Glass was announced. But there's only one issue. At least currently, it doesn't support augmented reality. Um, yes, it gives you information in your above your field of view, mm -hmm. uh, instead of kind of looking at your phone and you can interact with it using uh, your voice, that's great. Uh, but it doesn't really overlay graphics on the real world. So in a sense of, uh, is it really distracting you from reality or is it making you more aware of reality? I think it's, it's swinging a bit more towards the distraction. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can imagine situations where I'm sitting in front of you and all of a sudden you start looking upwards and you kind of... Uh, uh, Googling or something like that, and I, and I feel like I lose you. So, so that's something that I'm I'm a bit uh, afraid of with with Google Glass. But again, I think it's it's a first step. Mm -hmm. And when people uh, are, are learning about it, they get excited. They're going to try it, and then that will uh, lead to um, more advanced augmented reality eyewear. Which, which by the way, there are at least a dozen vendors out there with amazing eye eyewear that already supports today. Um, see through augmented reality uh, the way you know we're talking about, it. and uh, I think Google Glass will help them actually become uh, you know come to the the awareness of the, the masses. Yeah, we already have very good examples of, of the, some of the capabilities. The only problem is that they're too expensive. And again, going back to the military, the F twenty two helmet I hear is about two million dollars, uh, but that has from what I read about it, absolutely amazing um, augmented reality capabilities. Uh, highly complex, highly expensive system, so clearly not, not there yet in terms of uh, mass market and, and civilian usage, but at least we have uh, a product that we can talk about. Yeah, no, I, I think today we already have uh, a f several eyewear um, that support augmented reality that are below $1,000. Can you give us a few examples? Yeah, um, you know, there's the Vuzix company that has been in the space for some time, initially with uh, video glasses, now with uh, uh, see-through and, and, you know, augmented reality glasses. Um, and, and the, you know, that's selling for, you know, some of them are higher than 1,000, some less. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's, that's one. There's uh, uh, Epson, which came up with the uh, uh, Vario glasses, which, again, is, is uh, below that range. Uh, and they're, you know, they're, not that uh, awful looking, you know. You could actually see yourself walking with these glasses on the street. Maybe not for everyone yet, mm -hmm. uh, but it, but it's getting there. And you know, it's relatively light. And uh, and again, together with these guys, we I think there's at least another ten or, or twelve vendors that are working on these glasses. A lot of them, you know, we're going to see them soon in, in conferences presenting their products. And uh, and the price will go down very quickly. Uh, because right now a lot of them are sort of in the prototype st stage, so yeah. it's still expensive. Yeah, but once you know you sell uh, a few tens or hundreds of thousands, the, the price will drop to something that, which is, I think, very affordable uh, for anybody. Just like you know a mobile phone under the two hundred dollar mark, uh, yeah. and at that point they also look pretty good. Uh, they will be functional, 
and there'll be enough content to, to justify purchasing these things. So, so I think it's, it's not too far at all. Yeah, coming, uh, speaking of that, maybe Apple or whoever else wants to be on the next wave of tech uh, should be looking into that because that might be one technology that kills the phone, for example, as we know it. Uh, as something yeah, and we, we know hold in our hands and press buttons on, right? Yeah, and we know that all the big guys are working on this uh, just by judging uh, uh, the patents that have been issuing, whether it's Google and Motorola together now, um, whether it's uh, you know Microsoft or Apple, yeah. uh, you know you see what Sony is doing and, and Epson and, and other uh, giant electronic companies. Um, so yeah, I mean I think they're all going to fight over this. Uh, but for now, I think besides Google Glass, uh, most of the other vendors are actually small startups with uh, amazing innovations that are trying to kind of spearhead this this movement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me ask you this then. So are you, suppo- are you surprised by the pushback by, uh, towards Google Glass? Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples. First, uh, there's already clubs in San Francisco and areas which have explicitly banned uh, Google Glass. And another example, I just moved into a new condominium building uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I was surprised to find out that any such devices are also banned uh, in the common area uh, of the building. That's to say in the gym, in the lobby, in the boardroom, in the party lounge, all those areas banned. (laughs) So what do you think of that? So, uh, you know, just like with any new technology, you have the people that are excited and enthusiastic about it and adopt it. And then you have... The other half, which just is afraid of it, uh, you know, they like the status quo and, and they're going to uh, be reluctant to adopt it as long as possible, right? And, and it, it happened in every single technology. I'm sure it happened with the wheel, you know, like 50,000 years ago and also with... Uh, the, to- uh, the, co- the Tokugawa regime banned the usage of wheel for anyone except for the emperor. Here you go, you see? Yeah, for 200 <laughs> years, I think. And even yeah. electricity, you know, just 100 years ago, uh, many people were afraid of this, you know, it's going to burn the house and it's going to blind you and all these weird things. And then, you know, what was interesting at the uh, Chicago Fa- uh, World Fair, where for the first time they lit up the entire uh, fair with, with uh, electricity. Light bulbs, yeah. And, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, it became clear, okay, you know, it works, it's easy, it doesn't burn anything. And, and from that point on, it was adopted by everybody very quickly. So, so I think, you know, we're going to go through the same process. Now, I think, you know, there's going to be this concept of wearing versus not wearing. And, you know, I think most people will wear it most of the time because it will just make their life better and the work uh, more productive. But then there will be those, you know, moments in life where it will either be required for you or will just feel that you have to take it off mm-hmm. and kind of disconnect for a few moments, I think many wives will be, uh, you know, important in that in that uh, uh, in that part because just like today, you know, uh, helping us stay sane in many cases and kind of uh, drop our, our mobile phone for a few moments. So I think the same will happen with, with this, and um, and you know, we'll try to be more kind of a face-to-face interaction without all these augmentations. So that's definitely going to happen, but you know, it's it's just like with any other new technology that is uh, being adopted. Mm-hmm. You know, when you mentioned the terms wearing versus not wearing, uh, you reminded me so much of Werner Vinge's book, Rainbow's End. Exactly. Have you read yeah. that book? Absolutely. That's from there. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, when it's, you know, when from eyewear it becomes contact lenses that you wear on, and, yeah. and sometimes you can't even see if somebody has it on or not. Uh, it's You have to actually ask somebody, are you wearing or not? Um, and again, just like in the book, Many people will just wear it all the time, and uh, but in some cases you'll just have to uh, drop it, remove it, and uh, and be real for a moment. Mm-hmm. Be real. <laughs> okay, so that's going back again to our conversation. What is real? Uh, which is kind of like the Matrix question, but uh, I'll just skip it for now and and, and sort of uh, sail on. Uh, in your presentation uh, for the upcoming conference in Toronto, uh, I've seen the sort of the synopsis of it. 
uh, and you talk about the three laws of uh, augmented reality. Would you mind talking a little bit more about those? Absolutely. It's the, the three laws of augmented reality design, specifically. Ah, I see. Um, and, you know, of course, it's sort of a tongue-in-cheek over the, the three laws of, of Newton and then uh, the three laws of robotics. Um, but it's, it's, the idea was to try and uh, encapsulate really what separates good augmented reality design versus the bad ones that really doesn't advance us towards our goal. And uh, it's, I think it's, it's because, uh, you know, what I've seen in the last uh, five or six years since I've been kind of championing the space is that um, we're getting to a point where it's really easy to build an augmented reality application. Anybody can do it. Anybody can publish it on a, on a mobile phone. Um, and we're seeing a lot of crap, you know, between us. What can you do? Uh, and that is, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the, the game, right? But... I think now uh, it's important for people that really understand the space and, and have been developing these apps uh, for some time to actually help guide everybody else, you know, where it should go. And, and it's really going to be all about the designers. Mm -hmm. The designers are going to basically make this thing work or it's going to fail. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the technologists have done their job. You know, it's, it's in a point where it's good enough. You know, there's a lot of great ways to experience augmented reality. Of course, there are advancements to be made, but, but it's really good enough. And now it's really about designers kind of inventing a whole new language of interaction. Uh, and, you, you know, you can maybe learn from what you, you know about human-computer interaction, but this is totally different. Uh, so we have to think about it in a whole new way. So, so I was trying to kind of encapsulate those three laws. Um, I found this, uh, this blogger called uh, Lex Ardez with uh, the three laws. And, and he basically says three extremely simple things. But I think that if you adhere to those uh, laws, uh, you'll end up with a, with a pretty good experience. And, and the first one is that the experience has to emerge or relate from the real world. I, I think, you, you know, we've all seen many marketing campaigns where you slap a video or an image on on some marker or target, which has nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's cool for three sec seconds if you, you've seen it for the first time, yeah. but it doesn't really enhance the, uh, the experience. It doesn't engage you uh, more than, than, you know, just looking at it on a website. So, so I think that that's really a, a key, and, and I agree with that point. The second one is that augmented reality must not distract you from the real world. And that is key. That's kind of going back to our discussion before, vir virtual reality versus augmented reality mm -hmm. you know what's really the point of augmented reality it's, it's to make mm -hmm. us more aware and more engaged with the real world we want to be more in the now uh, so if, if the experience is kind of distracting you from the world then it's probably not doing uh, a good job and maybe may, may, maybe it's a it's a valid experience but you should probably use virtual reality for that kind of experience mm -hmm. and then the third one is you know it's it's very it's even broader than the other two laws and that is um, that the experience you're building has to be better than all the other other alternatives, right? Mm -hmm. So, so if you're building an experience that you know you watch a video on on a bottle or on a poster or whatever it is, um, why not watch this video just on your mobile device or on a computer or whatever, right? I mean, what's the added value of watching this video? Mm -hmm. um, so. So you have to always compare the design that you're working on versus the other options of, of making it work. And, and if it's not, if you don't feel like it's going to be a, a, a superior experience, then just don't do it. Use the uh, existing ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good principle in, in most things, actually. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, not, you know, it's not inventing anything really new here. It's, I think the simplicity is what's really nice about this. And, you know, when, when I look at, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of uh, new applications and projects every week, and, and I try to look at everything out there, uh, I, I found that this is really a great way to kind of, as a litmus test, you know, to see what's good and what's, what, what can be improved. And, uh, and if, you know, we can provide this as a guidance for designers out there, I think it will help improve the overall uh, state of, of augmented reality applications and really drive us towards the goal of, of driving the adoption and, you know, making it really meaningful for people that use it. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you about uh, if and where 
odds fit in those laws that you just mentioned? Would advertising be the way to pay for augmented reality? And if yes, then how are ads going to fit within that? Yeah. So ads, you know, it's it's one of those areas that will completely change with augmented reality, right? Um, the whole notion of billboards, the whole notion of sitting in front of a TV and, and you know, watching commercials, all that I think is going to completely change because um, people are not going to uh, want this, this kind of uh, intrusion into their field of view and their now with all these things. However... Uh, I think it's not like, you know, the end of, of advertising or, or, or branding. I think it's the opposite. What augmented reality does for for brands and for companies that want to advertise their products, it's it's the killer dream for every marketer out there. <laughs> but um, is it the killer dream for every user? Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, for every, every marketer and, and and without compromising the user experience. Because I, I see that in kind of three steps, right? So first step. Um, I'm looking for a product. I want to buy something. So now augmented reality can help me, can guide me. Where is it in my neighborhood? Where is it uh, in the store? Uh, when I'm looking at a box, it can tell me what I can do with it. It can show me how I can use it. So in a sense, it's, it's helping me understand the product and buy what I really need in a much easier way. Now then when I take it home, when I interact with the product, it's literally like the, the marketer is sitting on my shoulder and watching what I'm watching and, and understanding how I interact with the product. So from that perspective, uh, it can, you know, first of all, train me to, to work, to interact with the product in a more, in a better way. It can also learn, you know, what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, you know, how, what I like, what I don't like. And that is the most valuable feedback any marketer can get. So in a sense, it's, it's driving the engagement with the brand and with the products to a whole new level it was not possible before. But isn't that the most dangerous thing? I mean, you have the marketer, as you said, over your shoulder, looking at what you do, how you do it, when you do it, why you do it. And who's to say that we can't... Isn't that what the meaning of Big Brother is, in essence? Yes, you know, of course. I mean, many many people are, are kind of raising the, uh, the fear from the Big Brother uh, because of all the cameras and and all the augmented reality that we're going to see around. And, you know, there's definitely some something in that, that fear. But if you think about, you know, when, when you browse online, whatever you do online, there are a million eyes that are watching every step you make. Uh, and, you know, there's always this kind of battle between privacy and, uh, and transparency and so on. And, and it's going to continue to happen. Uh, but even today, you know, when, when you click on a website, People analyze every click you make and try to understand what's what you're thinking and what's behind uh, your your behavior. So now you know we're just going to take it to the next level and understand it better. Coming in my own home, in the washroom with me, in in my bedroom, in the swimming pool, like everywhere. I you know, go. You, you can always turn it off. Again, I, you can I hope always so. turn it off. I hope so, but just like you know, modern cell phones, you the only way you can really turn them off is if you remove the battery, right? Because <laughs> You can't really turn them off. If you turn them off, they can always be turned on remotely. Yeah, we need a, we need a kind of a plug to be able to pull it from the wall so that exactly. we know for sure. And, and because that, that's, that's one of the big concerns with the technology. And I mean, uh, helping you buy stuff is, is cool. It's fine when you do need that. But buying or, or purchasing stuff is only a small part of our activities that we do, right? And it, it would... Wouldn't it sort of feed into us being even more consumerist society than we already are? Because, I mean, I would like to think that the vast majority of time that I'm spending and we are all spending as a society in terms of buying decisions and things like that is, is minor compared to the rest of the things that we do during our day. And this would tend to overwhelm us because everything would be like, okay, I just happened to walk into a store to meet my friend and go out for a coffee, but maybe the device would imagine I'm there to purchase something and would start bombarding me with all those things. And then I'll be like, okay, well, maybe I do really need to purchase those <laughs> things. And I'll end up buying them, for example. Yeah. No, I think, you know, this is kind of the, the whole battle over the settings, uh, you know, yeah. in Facebook, for example, right? You have yeah. to really find the right level that is uh, tuned for what you want to do at a certain moment. 
but I think to your point, it's it's just like the internet and you know uh, barcode scanners made us better shoppers. You know, we spend less time, I think, uh, on on shopping a specific product, and and we make we make better decisions. We get you know better prices. Mm-hmm. So I think augmented reality is going to help uh, advance that trend. Uh, are we going to consume more? I don't know. That's kind of beyond me. But are we going to be smarter at shopping? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And let me give you um, a couple of um, really extreme examples here. But uh, Corey Doctorow is a big proponent of some of those uh, ideas and, or at least considerations that we have to help to have while building those new technologies. And the issue here is one about DRM, digital rights management, and about privacy. Uh, now, you've already mentioned a very sort of expansive, uh, all-inclusive definition of augmented reality. So let me give you this scenario where you have a person with a cochlear implant, right? Under your definition, that's definitely an augmented reality because it helps the person hear. Uh, it could uh, enhance certain uh, parts uh, of, of, of the sound from certain areas and, and help him hear better and mute others. Uh, for example, if you're in a conference in a very noisy environment and you wanna, just want to hear a specific voice, you can sort of mute down the rest of it and just focus on that or whatever. But with digital rights management, you are basically giving the right of the uh, producer of that device to through back channels that you have no control over, basically not only uh, provide augmented, but also disaugment the reality around you. So in other words, they can turn up or turn down the world around you, and they can even remove certain things. So they can, let's say uh, the person with the cochlear implant is a six-year-old kid, and their parents want the kid never to hear the words you know, or any swearing words. And and they sort of censor their kid, if you will, in that yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, it's called diminished reality. Yes, diminished rea- the reality of swearing around the kid, whatever. Yeah, and, and, and some people say, you know, I'm going to walk on the street and uh, what if I want to erase from Certain my view people. all the Republicans or all the yeah. Democrats and, exactly. and just live in my own bubble? Yeah, precisely. You know, that's, that's going to be part of the game, uh, which I think, again, is already happening today. People build... Uh, live in, in bubbles depending on, on who they meet, what they watch on the, on the, you know, net or TV or whatever. And they kind of create their own, uh, environment that they like to see. So, uh, in a sense, we'll be able to actually take that to the extreme. Absolutely. We literally see and, and feel only what you want to feel, which could happen. Absolutely. But the difference, I think, is that we kind of at least have the, the presumption that we're in control of our own bubbles, how they shrink or expand. Once you purchase a device from the market which intermediates your interaction with the rest of the world, then perhaps a third party, maybe the company, maybe a hacker, maybe a government, would be able to do that for you and leave you unaware. Just like, for example, you have digital rights management software on your computer nowadays, which, you know, if you want to do certain things with your OS a message pops up and comes up and says, I can't let you do that, Dave. <laughs> right? So, and, and you know, I own this computer, but and, spe- and that's particularly true if you're uh, a Mac user, and that's one of the reasons why I'm not a Mac user, I, I, because I build my own computers. Um, but, you know, if you don't buy a, a something from the Apple store, you can't really use it on a Mac, can you? No, there are certain things you can, but, but I see your point. I mean, Very and, few. and I'm actually, I'm actually, I became a Mac user, you know, several years ago, and ever since then, you know, everything is Mac, uh, which is, you know, kind of forcing me to do this. But, yeah. but I, I decided to, I chose this because of the experience, because I feel the, the overall experience is better, although I may be kind of, you know, put into a certain certain uh, wall garden that doesn't allow me to customize things to the nth degree. Like I can with other uh, platforms, but you know it's a, it's a choice. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it is a choice, and I am using uh, an, uh, an iPhone myself because I can't actually build one myself. <laughs> so, and it does work in that sense, right? So I was like, okay, I'd rather I get something that works because I can't actually make a phone. It's too small for me. I don't have the knowledge. I can b put a computer together, but not a phone. Anyway, perhaps we should move on uh, with those questions about privacy, but I think our society would definitely have to confront those issues. Um, so... Let me ask you a few questions about the organizations that you're affiliated with. What is Augmento, first of all? So Augmento is uh, the, the first uh, company I founded, uh, co-founded in the space um, back in 2010. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, after seeing my kids in, in front of those computers and, and kind of trying to find a way to get them into the real world, I thought that the games would probably be the, the best way to do this, uh, you know, because everybody loves it, not just kids. Mm -hmm. uh, they're fun, uh, and, you know, you can learn from that. And, and it's a great way to uh, introduce a new technology to this audience because they're always open for, for new things. They're not afraid to try new, new technologies. Mm -hmm. So we decided to focus on, on the first company in the space on building augmented reality games. Uh, so uh, joined forces with... Uh, four other co-founders, two from the gaming space and two from uh, the technology side of things that actually built uh, where, you know, PhDs in, in developing computer vision systems. Mm -hmm. And together we, we formed this company. We got uh, one of the first uh, uh, venture-backed uh, uh, funding for, uh, for an augmented reality company mm -hmm. uh, in gaming. And, uh, and we started to develop uh, location-based and augmented reality games with the idea to introduce the technology step by step uh, so that people, uh, so we can actually ad drive people to adopt it on a mass uh, scale. Mm -hmm. And there were some really cool uh, um, games that came out, um, some prototypes that I think were very advanced. Um, and, and about a year ago, I, I decided to leave uh, to really spend all of my time on, uh, on driving the community uh, and helping advance augmented reality as a whole which was my passion for, for six or seven years now. Now, when you say driving the community, is that, uh, are you referring to augmentedreality.org? So, yeah, so we, we started this nonprofit organization to, to help kind of coalesce a lot of the activities that I and, and many others have, have been uh, doing in the space. Uh, so it's, you know, pretty sim simply put, uh, a nonprofit organization dedicated to advance augmented reality for humanity. And uh, we have it, we're doing basically three key things. Uh, we're educating, we're connecting, and we're hatching. Mm -hmm. uh, educating both the developers, designers in the space as well as the, the market at large about the you know how augmented reality can really meaningfully change the way we interact with the world, and, and not you know go beyond the gimmicky stuff and the, the things that people have seen and may have disappointed them, but really focus on on where we can really drive. Uh, a whole new uh, level of interaction. Mm -hmm. We're also connecting people uh, online and, and in local as well as global events. You mentioned the Augmented World Expo, uh, which is the largest augmented reality event in the world in, in happening in Santa Clara. And, and that's where this year we, uh, we're planning to have about 1,000 people to come in uh, with over 100 demos of augmented reality and really help uh, connect people with technologies, people with people, uh, help them you know, kind of learn about the space, learn from each other, inspire each other, and also hatch, which means help drive new augmented reality initiatives and startups. Mm -hmm. so, so part of, you know, kind of what I do is, is advise augmented reality startups uh, in, in, you know, v different fields, different uh, industries, which is really fun. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, by connecting people and educating, I think we're also helping people to hatch these new initiatives um, you know, just by sharing information, you know, you know who to talk with, what products are out there, what technologies are available, and what people have done in, in each one of those industries, it gives you kind of a head start to create initiatives that are more successful. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're doing all of this towards our goal, which is, um, you know, we kind of define our moonshot, if you will, to have one billion active augmented reality users by the end of the decade. That is by, by 2020. Now, um, yeah. is it uh, huge? 
may may sound like that, but it's actually uh, I, I think, think we're, we're on on track to, yeah. towards that goal. But it's it's really uh, it's really going beyond the uh, number of downloads that people are tracking today. I mean, I've seen some reports saying that by t- I think 2015 we'll have about a billion downloads of augmented reality a month. And yeah, I mean, I've seen many downloads, but I want people actually to be actively using this mm-hmm. to improve whatever they do, whether it's work or, or you know, life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in order to, to get to that point, I think it's, it's kind of we need to harness the whole community and all the key players in the space to really um, educate everybody else, you know, about the, the right way to do things, the right technology that can achieve those goals and, uh, and help drive it in a way that, is, uh, that has a positive effect on humanity. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So... Uh, you know, as part of my preparation, I actually looked into uh, all of those. And, and when I was looking at the information about the Augmented World Expo uh, this year, uh, it, it was one of those events that made me pre- feel like, oh, my God, I'm in the other end of the world and I'm going to miss that too. And it looks so good. So if if I were anywhere close by, I'd definitely be there to check it out because it, it looks fantastic to me. Thank you. Um, now... We've been talking about augmented reality for about 40 minutes, maybe 45 minutes by now, but let me take you a step further down the path and ask you to talk a little bit about augmented humanity or what some some would call transhumanism. I think it's uh, it's connected, of course. Um, Isn't it the next natural step of progression? I mean, first... The computers that augment the reality are outside of our body. Uh, next, they're on contact lenses on our body. And then finally, they'll get into our body. And transhumanism in many ways is about, you know, adopting technology to improve our life and make things better, easier, faster, healthier, generally better than... Yeah. No, I, th- I think uh, augmented reality basically um, diffuses a lot of the fears that people have from transhumanism. I mean, when you think about, you know, plugging something into your brain or, you know, enhancing your hands with, with robotics, that, that's scary. Uh, what augmented reality does is it allows us to enhance ourselves in a natural way through our natural senses, right? So whether it's, the, you know, the visual or, or audible or whatever other sense we have, so it's, it's a, it's, it provides a more evolutionary path towards making us, you know, superhumans. So in a sense, I, that, that's why I, I like it so much. And, and in a sense, uh, I, I think, you know, once we learn how to become better through our natural senses, you know, people may, may start kind of injecting those uh, uh, enhancers into our bodies and it will be much more natural. Uh, but, you know, it, all of a sudden, you know, we don't need to wait for those uh, plugs to be better. We can do this through our natural senses, which I think is what, making AR so uh, attractive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, speaking of injecting those sensors into our body, uh, that reminds me very much to Ray Kurzweil, who says that, you know, eventually we'll be able to put nanobots the size of a blood cell, uh, billions of them into our body, and they will be straight into our brain, and they'll be able to project the augmented reality straight inside of the brain. Um, So... Let me ask you this. What's your take on the technological singularity and Ray Kurzweil? Uh, I, I think Ray Kurzweil, you know, I'm not going to be the first to say that. He's, he's a genius and he's uh, way out there in the future and, and helping us kind of see the way. Um, I'm, I'm more of a you know, product guy in the now. You know, I'm kind of working on with what I have. And, you know, I can see where this is going, but I'd like to build products right now. So... So for me, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of out there. I, I always, you know, listen to his talks and, and watch his movies and read his books, um, just kind of to, to understand where this is going. But I, I tend to spend most of my time in, in the here and now. Mm-hmm. Well, yet, on the other hand, he says if you're an inventor or entrepreneur, you should be planning for not what's there up on the market right now, but five years from now, so that by the time your invention, your product, whatever it is, your business is ready for the big time, already it's like up to date to the latest. Absolutely. I, I think you would agree that everything I, I've been talking today is at least, you know, five years Absolutely. out I there. So, yeah, that, that's why I, that's why I, I am when I mean uh, the here and the now, but it's not the 
you know, 20 or 50 years you ahead. You mean like the short term, like five to 10 years? Yes. Yes. I get exactly. it. Okay. Great. Great. So, Ori, uh, it's, it's been a, an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Uh, but, uh, unfortunately time is advancing. So let me just, uh, run you through my last, uh, traditional two questions that I ask of everybody on my show. And the first one is very simple and straightforward. Where can people find more about you and your work? So I think the, the best, um, place to, to find information about, uh, you know, kind of what we do, what I do is, uh, in two spots. It's the augmentedworldexpo.com which is our, our uh, conference website, mm-hmm. which is just tremendous amount of information. Just, just when you look at, you know, who's coming to the event, the companies that will participate, the awards that will be given there, uh, it, it kind of gives you a great snapshot of what's happening, the key players, and mm-hmm. so on. So, mm-hmm. so that, that's a great place to start. And, of course, also augmentedreality.org, which is uh, evolving to really help support this community and enable the uh, kind of connecting people and educating, not just for those two or three days at the conference, but 365 days a year. Uh, so that's where the kind of the augmentedreality.org is, is going to come into play. Uh, and we're also partnering with uh, a bunch of other augmented reality conferences around the world. So, you know, it's becoming something that is happening uh, all over the, the world throughout the year and is really helping advance, connect everybody, educate, and help advance this area. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So hopefully you'll make one in Toronto pretty soon. So that yeah, I mean we're we're actually pretty good partners with uh, with the Eastas event. Uh, you know, yeah. we're, we've contributed speakers and uh, and content and uh, you know trying to uh, the the more events the better. So you know we're we're definitely not competing with other events. Absolutely fantastic. So the final and perhaps the most important question that I want to ask you today is this. Is there a single message or perhaps the single most important thing that you would like people to take away from this interview with you today? I think I kind of touched on that before, uh, and it's really about designers, designers, designers. Um, again, technology has matured to a point where it's ready for the mass market. Uh, everybody, anybody can experience augmented reality today, and almost anybody can develop it. Um, but we have to think about how we develop it in a way that will really make it meaningful and, uh, and improve the way we do things. And that's why it's, it's kind of a call to action for designers out there, user experience designers, graphic designers, uh, product designers, hardware designers, anybody that, that basically thinks about how to make a product work for humans, this is the time to jump into augmenting humans in an augmented world and, and think about uh, what what it means for, for this new world and, and think about new ways to design it. Uh, and, you know, we're going to make a lot of mistakes and we're going to fail a lot, but I think through that process we'll learn what really works. And, and that's the probably the one sing, single thing that can make uh, augmented reality more meaningful and, and drive the adoption with the masses. Ori Inbar, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Nicola. It's been a pleasure.